Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second session of the fall series of the Ontology Summit 2020. Today we have a very distinguished speaker who really needs no introduction, uh, John Sawa, who will be speaking on knowledge graphs, past, present, and future. Okay, well, uh, thank you. And uh, um, I will just uh, be looking at the slides on uh, the screen in front of me. And um, I haven't had time to set up this Zoom, and I don't really like the Zoom anyway. So I'll just, uh, uh, just talk about the slides. And the thing that I want to talk mention about the uh, knowledge graphs is that as a uh, uh, notation, they're really just a, a subset of uh, the semantic web, uh, semantic networks that people have been developing for the past uh, 50 years or so. And, uh, but the main advantage is that they have been designed to scale to the immense size of the uh, www. Now the point is though that you gotta uh, do something with them and develop them and uh, uh, use them in various kinds of applications. Now, uh, Jan Asman in uh, last week's talk gave a very nice overview of the uh, general technology and of the uh, work that they've been doing. And I would like to emphasize uh, some of the things that uh, we've been doing at this company called Kindy and previously Vivo, Vivo Mind, and also how this relates to uh, what else is going on in the world and how all of these technologies can be related to one another. So uh, I'll just uh, go to the uh, next slide. The first, uh, uh, this is slide number two. It summarizes the early days of artificial intelligence. And I just wanted to emphasize how much had been done uh, during the 1960s. And uh, as early as 1960, how Wong implemented a theorem prover that took seven minutes to prove all 378 uh, theorems expressed in first order logic on the Principia Mathematica. And this was on an IBM 704. And the 704 is about uh, five times slower than the 7090, which is about the same speed as the original IBM PC. So you can imagine that if this took seven minutes of CPU time on the 704, which is just, um, I don't know, some huge number slower than uh, the uh, current technology, and it proved all these theorems that were expressed in first order logic, this seems that the technology was pretty good in those days. And note, by the way, that the people who say that, oh, we have to use OWL because first order logic is too slow, well, that is not quite true. There are, there's an Im immense amount of work that you can do with first order logic, and there's uh, an immense number of theorems that you can prove very efficiently on um, even the, uh, a, a technology as ancient, as ancient as the vacuum tube 704. And that was in 1960. Uh, and uh, around the same time, Emile de, de Lavenet wrote a book on machine translation, and he said, while a great deal remains to be done, it can be stated without hesitation that the essential has already been accomplished. In other words, just with the technology of the 1950-style com computers, he said that the essential has already been done for machine translation. And uh, I think that's a bit of an uh, exaggeration, but... Uh, the point is that they were doing machine translation even then. And 1965, I.J. Good, who has uh, uh, done a, a tr tremendous amount of work in probabilities and early uh, uh, work in AI, said, it is more probable than not that within the 20th century, an ultra-intelligent machine will be built and that it will be the last invention that man need make. Well, um, we're now uh, long past, we're now almost 20 years past the 20th century, and uh, we still haven't gotten there. Uh, Marvin Minsky was the technical advisor for the uh, movie, the uh, uh, 
uh, Space Odyssey 2001, and he, he said that the HAL 9000, which was the computer feature there, is a conservative estimate of the level of AI in 2001. And again, we haven't uh, quite gotten there. So there's a lot more that uh, needs to be said. Uh, there's also an immense amount of things that AI systems really can't do very well. And uh, on slide uh, three is the picture of uh, uh, two birds coming in for a, uh, uh, to their nest. And uh, uh, just look at that nest, this very complex nest, very messy and with all kinds of twigs and moss and situated in a uh, uh, tree branch uh, some uh, high up. And yet this is sturdy enough for them uh, to lay their eggs and hatch their eggs. And uh, they did this with irregular straw, irregular twig straw and moss. And no robot today can build a bird's nest uh, with the same, uh, just using the same kind of randomly accessible twig straws, moss, anything lying around. They just, they, the robots have precise precision instruments that then will guide them if they are very precise. They're also getting better for doing, uh, for walking around and so on, but they still can't build a bird's nest. And uh, a bird brain, well actually birds are actually quite intelligent little beasties and uh, they can do quite uh, well. Uh, another thing is, uh, this is the ultimate understanding engine, and I've quoted this before because it, uh, that it illustrates these issues. Uh, this is a child named Lara uh, who was uh, participating in uh, these uh, psychological and uh, tests. And uh, this was at a university where uh, the uh, uh, parents who uh, were able to drop off their kids at a daycare center, and they gave permission to the psychologist uh, to do various kinds of things as long as they were uh, nice things with the kids. And so this child uh, had had a lot of psychological experiments uh, even uh, at the age, uh, even while she was two years old. And so uh, these are some sentences recorded, recorded sentences of what she was saying. Like, here's a seat. It must be mine if it's a little one. And just look at that. Uh, she's uh, saying, uh, quite a lot of logic in just that little uh, one sentence. Next sentence, I went to the aquarium and saw the fish. Past tense, very nice uh, syntax. I want this doll because she's big. And then the, the last sentence, when I was a little girl, I could go geek geek like that, but now I can go, this is a chair. Here she's talking about her uh, uh, linguistic abilities at an earlier stage and at this later stage. And this is probably because she learned from the uh, psychologist that they're very interested in child language. So she wanted to tell them about what she knew. And this is an amazing amount. No computer system today can learn language, use it as fast as accurately as Laura. That's just um, uh, amazing. And it shows how much more we have to do. Now, um, uh, Jans gave a, a good overview of knowledge graphs. I'll just uh, mention a few comments. Uh, that uh, scaling up semantic nets to the size of the WW is the main uh, achievement. But uh, the uh, use of tree and graph notations to represent uh, language uh, and semantics, uh, Otto Zeltz had that in a book that he published in uh, 1913 with an update in 1922. And uh, then Lucien Teniere, who had been de developing dependency graphs, which are uh, still very widely used in natural language processing, and he was developing that into the 1930s, and his uh, final magnum opus was pub published posthumously in 1959. So in 1959, uh, they published the book that he had been writing for the past uh, dozen years or so. And uh, that technology uh, that uh, 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 that um, that uh, uh, Tenier developed is still widely used in uh, some of the latest and greatest uh, NLP systems today. And uh, RDF is just a subset uh, that uh, the RDF subset is widely used for these knowledge gra graphs, but that's just a tiny subset of the uh, kind of uh, language that could be represented uh, in these uh, dependency graphs, uh, even in the 1950s. 
So the point today is that natural language understanding is still a distant goal, and it's something that we really need if we want to make these knowledge graphs really easy to use and flexible uh, for everything. So in syntax semantics, in syntax and voice recognition, and uh, with approximate semantics, uh, that uh, th there are fairly good tools, but uh, anybody who's used uh, any of these telephone uh, systems where they have these uh, natural language things, uh, you very quickly get frustrated with them if you go anything off their little script that they can handle, and you're constantly calling agent when the uh, communication breaks down. And that shows that there's still a long way to go, and uh, these uh, telephone answering systems still aren't using these knowledge graphs. And even so, even if they did use the knowledge graphs, they can't, they wouldn't be able to handle uh, the many different kinds of things that you need to do. So uh, this gets to the problems and challenges. So the early hopes, for, and this is uh, slide, uh, slide six. So the early hopes for artificial intelligence have not been realized. And so the question is, have we been using the right theories, tools, and techniques? And why haven't these tools worked? And what other methods might be promising? And what other research is being done? And, and can it help us build more intelligent systems? Now, slide seven summarizes the Psych project, which is the most ambitious attempt to build the HAL 9000. Now, that project was founded by Doug Linnett in 1984. And uh, the starting goal was to implement the background knowledge of a typical high school graduate. And the ultimate goal was to learn new knowledge by reading textbooks. Well, uh, this is after the first 25 years, there was a, uh, uh, an evaluation of that project, of the psych project held at psych. And um, I was one of the panel of they had about two dozen people who were uh, around there evaluating, uh, spent a, a three-day meeting evaluating all the things that they had done. And after the first 25 years, $100 million, that's a thousand and 1,000 person years of work. Imagine one person working for a millennium uh, to build the uh, knowledge base for psych. They had 600,000 concepts defined by 5 million axioms, and they organized them in 6,000 micro theories. They have a hierarchy of these, not one big on top, one top level ontology, and then uh, 6,000 sub ontologies for all those special cases. And yet, psych cannot yet learn by reading a textbook. Now, this was the state of the art in 2004, and we're now another 15 years later, and they still cannot learn by reading a textbook, and they still cannot understand language as well as uh, Laura. So the um, question is, what more do we need? Now, the question is, what makes people intelligent? That's slide uh, eight. And the short answer is flexibility, generality, and adaptability. And the point is our languages today are still using the same set of concepts that uh, the same uh, ontology base of our Stone Age ancestors, uh, the, 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 the Indo-European languages that uh, uh, include everything from English to, uh, the, uh, to Sanskrit, uh, were uh, uh, spoken by people whose basic technology was at the level of the Stone Age. They may have, might have had a little bit of gold that they found, but uh, otherwise their, uh, in, their technology was about the same technology as uh, the Native American Indians and, uh, uh, well, the Native Americans who were called Indians, but, uh, and uh, other uh, tribes today that are still uh, using Stone Age implements. And yet their languages ha uh, with all of the additions that have been made, that that core of all of our languages, the core ontology, is still at the level of the Stone Age. But the thing is that uh, when people in any culture adopt anything, they can borrow or adapt words to uh, describe it in their native language, and they can extend that, that core by using metaphors and all sorts of other things. Now, one thing that I like is Marvin Minsky's answer to that question. And he says, what magical trick makes us intelligent? The trick is that there is no trick. The power of intelligence stems from our vast diversity, 
not from any single perfect principle. And this is one reason why I've been highly critical about uh, these proposed standards for ontology is that they are sort of fixed and frozen fossils and they might be useful for a very precise task, but they're not going to be able to handle ordinary language at the level of just a child. And, uh, and to continue with Minsky, he said, our species has evolved many uh, effective, although imperfect methods. The methods are imperfect, and each of us individually develops more on our own. Eventually, very few of our actions and decisions come to depend on any single mechanism. Instead, they emerge from conflicts and negotiations among societies of processes that constantly challenge one another. Now, this is a, there's a footnote there where you can uh, uh, get more Refer more references. But the point that I want to make is that's the answer to ontology. That's the answer to the knowledge graphs. You've got to support an open-ended diversity and a single fixed frozen ontology can be very useful for a particular uh, company or a special purpose project or even a special uh, industry-wide project of, uh, the, of a relatively precise, narrow scope. But on the other hand, if you're going to handle ordinary language, you can't hack it with a single, precise, formally defined ontology. The question is, how do you handle an open-ended family of, uh, I shouldn't even say family, an open-ended diversity of different kinds of ontologies and taxonomies and knowledge of any kind? That is the critical issue. Now, here's a case study of Psych and IBM Watson. The question is, why did IBM, not Psych, beat the Jeopardy champion? Because Psych had been starting from uh, 1984, and they had a very large, by 2004, they had that very large ontology. And you would imagine that uh, that would be a good basis for building something. Well, the short answer is that Psych was not designed for game shows. It was designed to represent the general knowledge of a typical high school student. Well, uh, it actually didn't get to that level, but th that was their hope. And um, But um, what IBM did was to devote a large research team to a single problem. Now, the longer answer that I would give is that Psych was based on a single paradigm. Formal logic, deductive reasoning, a very large ontology, and large volumes of data. That's very useful for a lot of projects. But what IBM did is to uh, start with many independently developed tools, and they made them interoperate on different aspects of the problem. So in a sense, the uh, Watson team really started from scratch, and in uh, just a couple of years, they were able to handle the Jeopardy problem uh, better than uh, Psych was able to do. But the next question is, is it possible to develop Watson-like systems without requiring three dozen PhD researchers? Well, that's what uh, IBM has been trying to do. And uh, the uh, next slide uh, has IBM Watson for applications. And it's a hybrid with multiple paradigms. And uh, at the uh, uh, footnote there, it, there's a uh, you can click on it to see what it is. And the idea is that they have a wide variety of, uh, a wide variety of tools that they use, and they go around in a uh, cycle uh, using a variety of different tools to process whatever problem they're dealing with. And they have what they call a, uh, they, they get the uh, initial scenario, which may come from a question or some kind of problem statement, they analyze that scenario and they get an assertion graph. And the assertion graph, you consider that a small knowledge graph that uh, describes the problem that they're trying to handle. And then they do a wide range of different kind of processing to do that process. And that has worked for quite a number of problems, but uh, it's still not where uh, they hope to be, but it's still not bad. Now, the next slide, this is slide 11, uh, has Marvin Minsky's challenge, and this is from a uh, talk that uh, Minsky and uh, colleagues uh, present, uh, wrote in 2004. And they drew this diagram that showed the variety of different kinds of, uh, this uh, uh, three by three uh, matrix shows the variety of kinds of AI technology that is available today. 
And uh, at the lower left-hand corner is uh, the easy stuff. That's traditional programming. And uh, uh, the, there's an, there is an acronym, ASMOP, A-S-M-O-P, which stands for a simple matter of programming. And so anything that is a simple matter of programming, namely you can sit down with whatever your uh, normal language is and write a program, that's considered easy. And then uh, on the scale of from small problems to large, the large problems are symbolic logical reasoning. That's the kind of things that psych has been doing. And in the middle is ordinary sort of qualitative reasoning. Uh, then if you go down the bottom line, on the there's going from easy to linear statistical methods. This, these are all the many statistical packages that have been developed, going up to the connectionist and the neural networks and fuzzy logics and all of those. And that's going along the bottom line. Then uh, classical AI in the middle, that's the kind of stuff that uh, uh, was developed in uh, artificial intelligence from the 1960s to the 1990s. That's the mainstream sort of stuff. Uh, Case-based reasoning is a technique that uh, is uh, uh, that can use a wide variety of different technologies plus analogies. That's a that's considered very good, and uh, 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 for handling large uh, problems, analogy be, analogy based reasoning is also considered very good by uh, Minsky and his colleagues. But the upper right hand corner is the intractable stuff that is needed to handle what people actually do. And there the uh, comment is, we must find a better representation. So the question is, what kind of representation? Uh, now, the uh, uh, Minsky had written, uh, on the next slide, 12, Minsky had uh, uh, written a number of uh, books and published some articles and so on. And uh, one of the early books of the 1986 was this Society of Mind. And then his later book was The Emotion Engine. And uh, both of those books saw a bracket and developed those same basic ideas. And the emphasis that he has on heterogeneous interacting modules or agents. And the question is, can they improve computational efficiency? Can psycholinguistics and neuroscience help us design them? What kind of logic, reasoning, and semantics would they support? And would they use symbolic, statistical, or image-like representations? Or would they use an open-ended variety of representations? And the uh, short answer I would give is uh, yes to all of them. Uh, that, uh, that they would use an open-ended variety of symbolic, statistical, image-like, uh, with many kinds of logic and so on, and that's and that you, uh, and also guidance from psycholinguistics and neuroscience can help. Question is, what do you do? Well, uh, I would mention this company that um, uh, that this is a that uh, I mentioned. Uh, oh, my colleague Aaron Majumdar said that he might be able to call in and. Uh, uh, May, and maybe give some uh, uh, commentary and help. Uh, I don't know if he's called in yet, but um, uh, but uh, uh, there's a. I think, no, I don't you, see him you, yet. Okay, well, I don't know if he's uh, logged in. He might have just been on the call. Uh, if he called in that number, would he be on the list? You see? Yeah, you would. He might be anonymous. Well, there's no other anonymous person. Okay, well, okay, I guess he hasn't called. I, that's too bad because I spoke with him yesterday and he said he had a meeting with somebody scheduled for this time, but the person who was he was talking to was very interested in this kind of stuff, so he, but the both of them might listen in, but I guess they had other stuff. Okay, in any case, uh, this, uh, the Kindy technology uh, has uh, state-of-the-art methods of, the, uh, ver of all the kinds that uh, I've just mentioned, but the key component is what uh, we have been calling cognitive memory. And this is an associative storage and retrieval of graphs in log n time. Now, the important point about this is that you're not just indexing a single word, you're indexing it by an entire graph. And the second thing is you're not just finding exact matches, you're finding all approximate matches within a given epsilon. You tell it whatever measure, there's a semantic distance measure, and you say, for this semantic dis distance measure, give me all the graphs that are within that, 
in anywhere, uh, anywhere. And the uh, thing is, it, it uh, finds things in logarithmic time, and logarithmic time is uh, the same kind of uh, uh, extends to the uh, size of the internet. So if you take uh, uh, time t for uh, a thousand graphs, you would take uh, two t for a million graphs, three t for a trillion graphs, and so on. So it it really uh, uh, just the uh, it scales very nicely. Uh, and the, the point is that the analogies can support informal case-based reasoning, and also, you can specialize the analogies that formal reasoning is just a special case of analogies. The, the unification algorithm for uh, uh, formal re, uh, uh, deduction is just a highly disciplined version of an informal analogy. So if you can handle informal analogies for case-based reasoning, you can also use the same technology to handle the formal reasoning as a special case. In other words, you don't take logic as the foundation, you take ordinary language as the foundation, and you treat logic as a special case of ordinary language. And I think that's a better way to handle it than to assume the foundation for language. Okay, this is a basic summary of cognitive memory, and some people may have seen this before because I've used it in other talks, but it's basically a high-speed association, and you, there's a, uh, the last page has readings where you can find uh, uh, links to all this technology, all these papers if you want to do go into more detail. But the point is that uh, when people talk, they can describe the same things in many different ways with different ontologies, and for different purposes, they can uh, emphasize different uh, points of view. And the question is, how do you relate to all of them? And uh, uh, on page uh, 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 slide 15, it shows a little uh, structure that has uh, three uh, pyramids supporting a block, supporting another block. And uh, how do you describe that? And how would you describe it to a relational database? How would you describe it to some knowledge graph? How would you describe it to a conceptual graph? How would you describe it in first order logic? What would you do in uh, any of these things? Well, uh, on the uh, next slide, there's a mapping from, of English to a conceptual graph. And there's a sentence in English, a red pyramid A, a green pyramid B, and a yellow pyramid C support a blue block D, which supports an orange pyramid E. And that uh, uh, sentence in English is mapped to that uh, conceptual graph. The, the yellow circles represent relations, and then the blue boxes represent uh, the concept nodes. And the concept node, every concept node has a type label, and it may have a name like Pyramid E uh, has attribute orange, and it's the theme of the verb uh, of a concept of type support, which has as instrument a block D, which is attribute blue. So that's the uh, uh, conceptual graph that is derived from that, um, from that sentence in English. But now other people will use a relational database. And one thing that I've been mentioning many times is a relational database and a, uh, uh, a graph database, they're just two equivalent ways of representing the same uh, data. And the only difference between them is that um, is the way they organize the data and the uh, efficiency for different kinds of algorithms. As uh, what they represent, it's the same information, so it really doesn't matter. So. <clears throat> This is the one of the shows uh, two uh, relations, two uh, SQL style relations. That rep one is called the objects table, and the other is called the supports table. And uh, this could be trans the information in those two tables could be translated to a different sentence in English. That would say a red pyramid A, a green pyramid B, and a yellow pyramid C support a blue block D, which supports an orange pyramid E, a blue block F, and a blue block H support an orange block G. And uh, so very different sentences, very different, uh, uh, and then when you, oh, very different uh, graphs. Now, if you map a relational database to conceptual graphs, you can do that by taking every line, every uh, every uh, every line in the graph, uh, every line in each table, and mapping it to a little graph. So, for the objects table, uh, you take each of the uh, uh, 
each of the rows and you map it to a little graph of the form entity A, uh, the object's relation relates entity A to color red and shape pyramid. In the supports relation, each, one, each uh, row of that can be mapped to a little graph that says like the form entity A supports entity B. Now, what you can do is to assemble all those little graphs and uh, put them together uh, on the common nodes and you derive a conceptual graph that's different from the conceptual graph for the original one. So on slide 19, this is show the conceptual graph derived from the database. And that uh, on slide 20, there we have two graphs that represent the same structure. But they, are, but they use a different ontology, and they use a di uh, different selection of concepts and relations, that one has 12 concept nodes uh, versus 15 concept nodes in the other. One has 11 relation nodes versus nine relations. There's no similarity in the type labels. The only common commonality is in the five names, A, B, C, D, and E. Now, people can recognize the similarities. How is it possible for a computer to discover them? And well, uh, this, is a, this is a challenge that I posed to Aaron Majumdar. Uh, this was back in the year uh, when I first, uh, we first started uh, working on this VivoMind project. That was in 2001. And I said, can your, uh, uh, can your system uh, find the mapping between them? And Aaron had never tried that out. So he just said, well, I'll type them in. And he had a linearization. He typed both in as a linearization and then pressed the button to see what would happen. And guess what? It found the analogy. It says that <coughs> the graphs from the uh, RDB map to this, to and from the graph of this form from English. And uh, so on the left-hand side, there are the graphs derived from the database. And on the right-hand side are the graphs derived from English. And by repeated application of these two transformations, you can complete, do an exact translation of the one graph to the other. And uh, uh, this is an example that came out of my book in, uh, that I uh, knowledge representation book in 2000. And uh, I had said in that book that you had to do that by hand. But uh, Aaron just pressed the button and presto zingo, his computer system found that mapping. Now that was very encouraging. Now that was 2001. That was 18 years ago. And that same system was able to do uh, approximate mappings like how is a cat like a car? And it had an ontology for cats and cars and graphs representing them. And it found uh, uh, this analogy that the head of a cat is similar to a hood of a car. The eye of a cat is similar to headlight of a car. A cornea of a cat, like a glass plate. A mouth is like a fuel cap. A stomach is like a fuel tank. A bowel is like a combustion chamber. The anus is like an exhaust pipe. The skeleton of the cat is like a chassis of a car, the heart is like an engine, the paw is like a wheel, and fur is like paint. And so it found this analogy and uh, very quickly and uh, very nicely. Now, the uh, point is that it can also do approximate mappings. And there are two fa uh, factors that determine the semantic distance between graphs. And one is the ontology, the similarity in the types of concepts and relations. And the other is the structure, the similarity in the pattern of nodes and arcs. And the ontology is supplemented by a, an additional background knowledge. Now that background knowledge is the kind of stuff that you typically put in your knowledge graphs and it can use those things. So for example, eyes and headlights are related to light and there are two of each. So this is a formal ontology, but it's background knowledge. Heart and engine are internal parts with a regular beat. Skeleton and chassis are frames for attaching parts. Paws and wheels support the body and there are four of each. And then uh, when doing the matching, you always prefer a one-to-one -one mapping. So the head to the eyes to the cornea is a one-to-one -one map to the hood to the headlights to the glass plate. But um, the analogy engine can also skip some nodes uh, marked in red if uh, they're missing. So it, for example, in mapping the mouth to the anus, there's a path that goes from the mouth to the esophagus, to the stomach, to the bowel, to the anus, but the particular ontology omitted esophagus. It just went from mouth to stomach. And then from fuel tank to uh, fuel, fuel cap to fuel tank to combustion chamber uh, to muffler to exhaust pipe, 
is the uh, other analogy, but uh, the particular ontology omitted muffler, but in this approximate map, even though the ontology was missing some things, the uh, uh, analogy engine made some educated guesses uh, and filled in this uh, uh, esophagus and uh, uh, additional nodes. It assumed, now the red nodes are ones that I put that label in because the, neither ontology had that word, but I put the word esophagus there to show that's the missing thing that uh, it couldn't find. So this is a really interesting approximation. Now, <clears throat> that the point is that it can find exact matching that unifies two graphs or approximate matching. Now, I'd like to mention some uh, applications, and these applications illustrate the kinds of things that uh, uh, Kindy and VivoMind had implemented for uh, some various applications. And <clears throat> every one of these applications was specified by the client, and every one of them uh, was uh, paid for by the client. So the point is that these are not toy applications. The client said, these are the kinds of things that we want to deal with. And uh, uh, so the thing is that the uh, Kindy technology was able to uh, handle these applications. Now, the first one is an information uh, extraction project. And uh, this was uh, sponsored by the uh, US Department of Energy. And uh, <clears throat> on the next slide, uh, uh, that uh, there's a table derived from research reports, and uh, I uh, uh, won't go. Um, I won't mention that yet. But to uh, but uh, this the goal was uh, to uh, take information from these tables and extract that uh, information and uh, uh, and ma and, and uh, then. Uh, or excuse me, no, no, no. The table. No. I, I, I misspoke. The uh, table was generated automatically. The uh, the information was uh, derived from documents, so that so that uh, the uh, uh, that the all the people who were competing in this project were given uh, about uh, a, a whole bunch of documents. I forget the exact number of documents, but all the documents had something to do with. Um, chemistry and related issues. And the goal was to find, find uh, was to fill out a table, was to build a table with information extracted from those documents. And the people who sponsored this project, they had gone through those documents by hand and they constructed from those documents, they constructed the table that had all the correct answers in it. And the goal was to uh, there were 12 competitors who had to uh, compete on doing this project. And uh, for each report uh, it was necessary to, uh, that what the Kindy technology did, uh, actually well, this was with the VivoMind technology, which, pre which, which was in, folded into Kindy, map each sentence to a conceptual graph, analyze the anaphoric references, that's all the pronouns and named entities uh, linked together, and derive a large conceptual graph that represents every sentence in the entire document. Store the graph for the entire sentence in a form that could be accessed in which all of its subgraphs could also be accessed and indexed. And uh, so this was a huge graph for, the entire, for every sentence in the document. And then allow uh, queries to uh, ask questions about that cognitive graph. And so the questions were the same questions that the uh, uh, DOE wanted uh, the competitors to answer. So for each uh, line of the table, it asked a question that would generate the data in each row of the table. And then it stored the, uh, the answers in that uh, spreadsheet. Well, in that competition, the Kindy system got 96% of the entries correct. The second best score was 73%, and most scores were below 50%. Now, this was done uh, a, a few years ago, and so uh, things may have changed. But the point is that the, the cognitive memory was critical for doing this. And here's the example of the kind of stuff that was generated. It said uh, they wanted to find the, uh, uh, the there was several things they wanted to find for these various compounds. Like here's this compound with manganese, chromium, um, uh, carbon, nitrogen, water, and has a 
uh, that has a Curie temperature. That's at the point at which this uh, compound becomes uh, superconductive. And then here's the source from which it, uh, the source from which the report, the name of the report in which that from which that information was derived. And so this table was automatically generated by the uh, VivoMind technology from that original a set of documents that were provided by the uh, client and the Department of Energy. And so there it is. Now, uh, this was very nice. Now, the uh, uh, point is that, um, unfortunately, uh, this project uh, that um, uh, VivoMind won that project and was selected uh, for uh, getting a grant, except that guess what? <laughs> this occurred during the time that the uh, uh, this was this was one of the uh, one of the times when the government was shut down. I think what, what happened is uh, Newt Gingrich shut down the government. No, no, the Newt Gingrich shut down the government early. I forget who who which. Oh no, it was a different group. This this group was shutting down the government. Uh, in, uh, I think this was in the Bush administration, and they shut down the government. And uh, as a result of that, uh, uh, a lot of money was uh, canceled, and uh, they dropped, they cut the budget, and uh, a lot of money was lost. So we won the project. However, uh, the project was not funded, so that was too bad. But anyway, we did win the uh, that example. Now, this uh, second example is application to legacy reengineering, and this involves analyzing COBOL programs and analyzing the English documentation for the COBOLs, and, com and from the programs and the documentation, derive a data dictionary of all the data used by the programs, an English glossary of all the terms in all of the document, uh, on all of the terms it used in the documentation, and index and, and develop an index to the COBOL programs in which that documentation was mentioned. And uh, also uh, show how the glossary and the technology has evolved, the terminology has evolved over the years. And then uh, provide structure diagrams of all the program files and data and show discrepancies between programs and documentation. So show where there are errors in the programs. Now, it doesn't discover all errors, but at least it discovers some errors between the uh, uh, documentation and the programs. So that was the application. Uh, now, to translate English specifications to executable programs is impossible by any technology we have today, except for trivial little examples. And uh, so that's an unsolved problem. But there's a much easier problem is to translate the COBOL programs to conceptual graphs because the COBOL programs are in a precisely defined language with formal syntax, map them to conceptual graphs. Then those conceptual graphs provide the ontology for the programs. So then you derive the ontology from the, from the programs which are, from, uh, which are precise. So what you have is a precise ontology of the uh, programs as uh, derived, uh, and also uh, the uh, uh, the conceptual graphs that are derived from English has ambiguities, but the ambiguities in the English are resolved by looking at the ontology derived from COBOL. And so the COBOL uh, shows where, uh, and then uh, if there are any conflicts, the COBOL between the COBOL and the uh, documentation. Uh, they, they, they can be flagged and uh, show that there's a problem there. So uh, that's one of the examples. Here's the kind of documentation. Now, I, I'm not going to, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to read this, but uh, this is the kind of documentation. If you notice, this is, this is not ordinary English. This has all kinds of jargon and stuff in it. Anyway, the uh, system was able to handle that. And, it, uh, ha and in eight weeks, Aaron Majumdar and Andre Leclerc finished the problem and they derived the, uh, all the data and put it on a uh, nice CD-ROM. A major consulting firm, uh, by the way, this was Accenture, uh, estimated that the job would take 40 people two years to analyze the documentation and find all cross-references. With cognitive memory, uh, the VivoMind system completed that task in 15-person weeks. Uh, 
Unfortunately, Majumdar and Leclerc were paid for 15 person weeks of work um, as consultants. Uh, they were not paid for uh, the uh, uh, 40 uh, person years that uh, Accenture would have charged, uh, which is sort of too bad. Um, and they also just detected some discrepancies. I'm not going to go and then detected the uh, contradiction. And uh, also, they discovered this kind of, there, here's one of the interesting examples. That, uh, the, one COBA, they discovered a discrepancy uh, where um, in 1979, a COBOL programmer had made a quick patch. Two computers were used to assist human consultants, but there was no provision to bill for computer time. Therefore, the programmer named the computers Bob and Sally and assigned them employee IDs. And for more than 20 years, Bob and Sally were issued payroll checks, but they never cashed them. And uh, this, uh, the VivoMind software discovered these two computer employees because there was a, a clash in the uh, uh, in the ontology, because the ontology said that uh, uh, you know the ontology said that every employee is a human being and no human being is a computer, but there was this clash that said some employees are computers. That the uh, VivoMind uh, technology discovered that contradiction and discovered a, pa a, pr a patch that had been running in that program for over 20 years and nobody had uh, uh, noticed it. Well, uh, now also relating, the, the, the point is that this relates formal ontologies to informal ontologies. And um, this is uh, one of the issues that uh, is still not widely used. This is the kind of stuff that Kindy was developing and they're still continuing this project. Uh, there was also another project was application to oil and gas exploration. And this started with um, a project, this is, comes from uh, the University of Utah, where they had uh, the, a, an, an institute for uh, uh, geology, their geology and uh, uh, oil exploration uh, technology. They had a, an institute there at the University of Utah. And this was a, an application that was being paid for by Chevron. And uh, Chevron was, uh, uh, had this, wanted to be able to query uh, get information about uh, places, likely places for drilling oil wells. Now the source material was 79 documents ranging in length from one page to 50 pages. Some are uh, reports about oil or gas fields. Uh, they're English as written for human readers with no semantic annotations, no, uh, uh, no particular uh, uh, annotation with um, XML or uh, anything else. And uh, but, there, uh, and, but they had additional data from relational databases and other structured sources. They also had, uh, you, for the ontology, the lexical resources were derived from WordNet, CoreLex, and the IBM CSLI verb ontology, Roger's thesaurus, and other sources. And, this, and given that base ontology, that um, the computer system itself, the, uh, the VivoMind system, extended and, and enhanced that ontology by reading the book. So this is a kind of thing that uh, uh, that was the source material. And the, for a query, they would give a query that was a paragraph that described a potential oil or, or gas field and analogies would compare the query to the documents. Well, uh, Let's give uh, some examples of how this thing would work. Here's a query written by a geologist. This is on slide 39. Uh, the, que the query, now this is not a typical ordinary English query. Now, this, is, uh, this, is, this is what a geologist is saying. Turbidic sandstones and mudstones deposited as a passive margin low stand fan in an intraslope basin setting. Hydrocarbons are trapped by a con combination of structural and stratigraphic onlap with a large gap gas cap. Low relief basin consists of two narrow feeder corridors that open into a large low relief basin approximately 32 kilometers wide and 32 kilometers long. Now uh, when the uh, uh, now uh, uh, two consultants from uh, Utah came to uh, visit uh, us at VivoMind and they brought all that data and uh, came in on a Monday morning and uh, they tried to run it through the uh, VivoMind system, and Aaron was, Aaron was sitting at the system and running the data through it. 
And the queries, uh, the answers to the queries weren't really very good. But uh, Aaron was going to be adding some more uh, material to the system to handle this kind of stuff. And meanwhile, I was talking with the two, uh, with the geologist uh, uh, from the uh, University of Utah, and uh, what uh, worked with them to develop a very, very simple ontology, and it would actually be more like an, a taxonomy. And it really just grouped various kinds of things into uh, classes, such as a uh, uh, like geographic strata, ge uh, geological strata, and uh, time periods in the in the uh, uh, geological history, and then would also have various kinds of hydrocarbons and various kinds of uh, uh, rock formations. So this was just basically a very simple taxonomy that um, the uh, I worked with the uh, two geologists uh, from Tuesday to Thursday working on this, and then on Friday. Aaron took that additional piece of ontology and he tried it uh, to rerun the system on that, including some of the uh, additions to, that he made to the system during the week. And guess what? It produced a fantastically better answers. That, that it didn't, the answers I'm showing on the next few slides are not the ones that they produce, uh, are not the immediate ones. That was done with a lot more work added to it. But the point is that just in one week's time with two ontologists who had no uh, prior knowledge about de deriving information uh, ontologies, all they had was my uh, uh, consulting work with them, giving them some hints and suggestions about how to do this, and they went and developed the, this additional material on their own. Oh, 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 oh by the way, the, 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 the thing that they used to do that, when Aaron ran his uh, uh, program on the first day, it produced as a side effect, it produced this table of all the words that, uh, that the system could not find, like turbididic sandstones and mudstones. It could find sandstone, and uh, but a large gas cap. A gas cap is not the same as uh, a gasoline uh, a cap on your a car, or it's not the same as a cap that you might wear, uh, and so it had. They had to add some additional uh, words to handle uh, additional ontology to handle these various options. So all they did that, and at the end of one week, it was fantastically better with just that amount of ontology. Now, <clears throat> uh, here's what. Um, uh, the, the system did is, is in answering these carbon fields, and I'm not going to have time to answer this, so you can uh, go through the slides yourself. And here is how the system answered the question. What it did is it would link the uh, query to paragraphs from these various documents that contain the answer, and it showed that here is uh, on this diagram that, um, let's see, what is the number that, that doesn't have the number there? Okay, it's number 41, slide 41. Uh, linking the query to the paragraphs that contain the answer, it showed that uh, here is the, in green, it shows the original question about turbididic sandstone. And then it found a link to this, uh, um, this hydrocarbon field in the Vautreuil region of France. And it said uh, that it's in the country of France and that the formation is Grey d'Anneau and uh, the, it's in the uh, Eocene, uh, Oligocene uh, time period. And, uh, uh, and uh, also it selected the particular paragraph that had the best answer to that question. And here in the big yellow thing is the paragraph that had the best answer to the query, the best match that it found. And uh, uh, on the uh, previous thing, it showed uh, all of the uh, 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 all of the hydrocarbon fields ranked according to the uh, closeness of the match, and the one that um, I showed there is the one with the highest match. But it also showed a bunch of others, and it also had options of various kinds of preferences you could uh, use to get uh, to get your query. Now the point is that um, it showed how the answer was found, and it, this uh, it uh, that what happened is that that um, for many of the terms, they're not in the ontology, but what happened is that the system would generate a tentative uh, uh, conceptual graph for them, and it would look in cognitive memory to find similar conceptual graphs derived from other sources. And chapter 45, 44 and 45 of a textbook on geology happened to contain those conceptual graphs 
that uh, were that contained exactly the same words, and it used those words to develop it. So if we go back to the uh, diagram, the previous diagram, it showed. Uh, or, let's see. Oh, oh, wait, wait no, that's no. Go back. Go back to go forward to square to 43, and slide 43 shows how this uh, query was answered. It showed that uh, chapter 45 uh, that uh, Here's the uh, cha uh, the chapter 45 of the text had some background information on uh, narrow feeder corridors, stratigraphic onlap, and intraslope basin, and uh, this uh, uh, report by uh, uh, McCaffrey and research report by McCaffrey and Kneller showed uh, I uh, information for low stand fan, passive margin, and uh, Chapter four, uh, 44 of the text had uh, the uh, information for turbididic sandstones. So it's deriving this ontology by just uh, reading these documents, and then after it's derived that ontology, automatically it can uh, uh, derive the information uh, that it types out to the uh, user, and also uh, the, the person who asked the question, and it also uh, can, uh, and uh, it also. Uh, Gives, and it also, by the way, gives the option of follow-on questions. So the thing is that uh, when reading the 79 documents, it set, translates all the passages, but it doesn't do any further analysis of the documents. But when the geologist asks a question, that's when the uh, system does more detailed analysis to look for the phrases, look up those related phrases in cognitive memory, and then connecting those phrases, it might need further searches. So the, what happens is that the geologist isn't just asking one question, the geologist can have a kind of a Socratic dialogue with the system. And as the uh, geologist asks questions, the system is doing more analysis and more reading. And actually, what happens is that the system builds up a better ontology after it's answered the questions. So it's constantly improving the ontology because while it's answering questions, it's exploring in more detail. It's doing more detailed reasoning about all those documents and getting much, much more answers. So the ontology is improved dynamically. Now, uh, this is work that was done. Uh, a few years ago, and uh, you can find uh, references uh, on the slide 45 at the end. There's a lot of links, and you can uh, read more if you want. But the point is that this is the kind of work that uh, we're still uh, working on uh, just um, individual projects. But uh, one of the goals of this uh, system is to develop technology that can be uh, sold to the world so that anybody can use this. But there's a huge amount of work that has to go from taking software that you use at, uh, on to, de uh, to develop for applications that come from a customer. So this is one at a time applications tailored for whatever the customer needs to having systems that bulletproof systems that anybody can use to develop their own uh, uh, things. But the thing is, this is the goal that we're trying to reach and uh, um, uh, it's too bad that Aaron wasn't, wasn't able to call in because he could give you more information about some of the additional things that are going on and answer more questions. Well, I, I think we already exhausted our hour, but uh, we could have some questions if there's still time. Oh, unfortunately, we've run out of time, um, but uh, perhaps we could have a follow-on session. Is that possible? Well, and then uh, maybe Arun can make it? Well, we could try that. Uh, in fact, that would be something with, with, that uh, there's a lot more new stuff that's coming. And, uh, you know, I, I just, um, I should have told, uh, told mentioned this to Aaron earlier, but I just told him that this in the past week and he had already scheduled another meeting and he really wasn't able to collaborate with me in developing the slides. So most of these slides are from the older stuff and, there's newer material that's coming, and uh, it would be nice to have some of the new stuff. So I think what we could do is have a have uh, a, another talk, and I could give an uh, an, op an overview to introduce that based on what's here, and uh, sort of a follow-on to what's in this slide, 
in, in this uh, thing, and then Aaron could take over and, and uh, uh, cover most of the um, session. Yeah, so let's arrange for another session. Um, okay. So that, and then we can answer yeah. the questions. There were a lot of questions on the chat, and I don't think we could really do justice with them in the short period of time left, since actually we've gone over. Yes. Um, Just one, com one comment. Uh, can sure if we can request John to give again in the next talk that you are planning with Aaron or by himself a gist of what he talked again today so that people are tuned to the same frequency to ask the right question that we well, would have asked now I think the best thing to do is for the next uh, next period uh, let's let's. Uh, I don't know when this would be, but maybe probably when's the. I don't know if uh, Aaron would have time to do this in uh, October. W how long are these? Uh, how long is this session going to go on? Th these the uh, 2019 sessions going to continue? Oh, the fall okay, series um, probably. Yeah, fall series. Yeah, um, it's somewhat open ended. Um, uh, well, right now. We may have a speaker next week, and then we have a speaker on the 30th of October. Actually, that's uh, uh, well. That's awesome uh, November speaking. or uh, November would be better. Or so November maybe we can have. Yeah, let's arrange for early November. Well, okay. I, I'll have to talk with Aaron about this because we want to make sure it's a time that he can reserve in advance, and uh, we'll have uh, previous slides. The other thing we can do uh, this. These slides plus the uh, uh, voiceover will be on the uh, on the website, right? So on the what website, we can... and uh, and we now have a YouTube channel yeah. as well. Okay, so oh. that'll go on the YouTube, and what can happen then is that uh, uh, what we can then do is have uh, Aaron and uh, in the announcement it'll say please review at least the slides from the previous talk uh, and if you wish, uh, replay the thing so that we'll announce that this will be a follow on and anybody who wants to, uh, 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 who had not attended the previous version should uh, uh, call into, uh, should uh, review the slides, at least the slides. There's only 45 slides and then the, at the end of the slide, there's a lot of links to papers that have been published, and you can go to those papers. And so reading that would give pretty solid background so that anybody that um, would be listening to the next one version would really be able to get a pretty quick, uh, would be able to follow what's going on. Good, very good. Uh, um, Ken, can I interject and say that if the gap between this and the next talk is too long, and at least 15 to 30 minutes, if John can give himself to wrap our thoughts around what he Well, says. no, no, I think we don't have to do that because uh, there are only 45 slides. And you can simply say, please skim through these 45 slides. I mean, you can flip, uh, it, it only takes uh, 10 minutes to flip through those slides and maybe an hour or so to study them. And if you really want to spend that hour, you could also listen to the uh, uh, voiceover. And so if anybody wants to spend an hour, they could do that. But just 10 minutes to flip through the slides is probably uh, good enough. I was talking about interaction, more time for interaction with you, John. Oh, well, that's uh, the interaction could, uh, I think what we can do, oh, the way we could handle this, that um, I could give, say, a 10-minute overview. I wouldn't use the same slides. I would use a different set of slides, and uh, then Aaron would have his own slides, and uh, we can have a lot more interaction in, with those. Okay, well, uh, so I'll be in contact with you to arrange that. Um, and so now I guess I'll close the meeting.